One, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the show, I have a report of some interesting facts about this year's Academy Award nominees. Gina Bennett tells about the word as. It may be short, but it has a lot of uses. And we close the show with an American story. The Fall of the House of Usher, Part 1 by Edgar Allan Poe, coming up. But first, here's Brian Lynn. Scientists have mapped the largest coral reef off America's Atlantic coast. Researchers say the reef stretches about 500 kilometers from Florida to South Carolina. At some points, it is 109 kilometers wide. The researchers measured the reef using 3D mapping technology. It's eye-opening, it's breathtaking in scale, Stuart Sandon told the Associated Press. He is a marine biologist at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Sandon was not included in the research. Ocean scientists have known since the 1960s that some coral life was present off the Atlantic coast. But the reef's exact size had remained a mystery. New underwater mapping technology made it possible to construct images of the ocean floor in three dimensions. The largest yet known deep coral reef has been right under our noses, waiting to be discovered, said Derek Sowers. He is an oceanographer at the nonprofit group Ocean Exploration Trust. Sowers and other scientists recently released maps of the reef in the publication Geomatics. The reef was found at ocean depths from 200 to 1,000 meters. Deep sea life cannot use sunlight to carry out photosynthesis. Instead, reef corals at extreme depths must filter food particles out of the water for energy. Deep coral reefs are known to contain animals such as sharks, swordfish, sea stars, octopus, shrimp, and many kinds of fish. Unlike deep coral reefs, Tropical reefs are better known to scientists and sea explorers alike because they are easier to reach. The world's largest tropical coral reef system, Australia's Great Barrier Reef, stretches for 2,300 kilometers. Sowers said it is possible larger deep-sea reefs will be discovered in the future since only about 25% of the world's ocean floor has been mapped in 3D. Only 50% of U.S. offshore waters have been mapped. Maps of the ocean floor are created using high-technology sound equipment called sonar on ships. Eric Cordes is a marine biologist at Temple University and a co-writer of a study on the mapping operation. He said deep reefs cover more of the ocean floor than tropical reefs, but both are currently facing similar risks, including climate change and damage from oil 
and gas exploration activities. I'm Brian Lynn. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences on Tuesday announced the nominees for Hollywood's highest movie awards, the Oscars. As usual, there were surprises. And there were snubs, meaning filmmakers or films that were rejected as candidates. Here are some of the facts about this year's nominees. Actor Jodie Foster was nominated for her performance in a supporting role in the film Nyad. It is her fifth nomination. The first came 47 years ago, when she was just 14 years old. This year, she returns as a nominee after an unusually long absence from the Oscars. Her last nomination was for Nell in 1995. Foster has won two Academy Awards as a lead actor. Her first came in 1989 for the movie The Accused. She won again in 1992 for the film The Silence of the Lambs. Her co-star in Nyad, Annette Benning, is also nominated for an Oscar in the Best Performance by a Lead Actress category. Like Foster, Benning has been nominated four other times, but she has yet to win any Academy Awards. Foster has more nominations than the rest of the actors in her category combined. Emily Blunt, Danielle Brooks, America Ferreira, and Divine Joy Randolph are all first-time nominees. Foster's gap between nominations is not a record, though. Last year, actor Judd Hirsch got his first nomination in 42 years for his performance in The Fablemans. Music writer or composer John Williams is back in the running for an Oscar. The 91-year-old became, on Tuesday, the oldest nominee in history for his original score for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Williams broke the age record of 90 set last year by nominee John Williams. The composer has been nominated for 54 Academy Awards. He is the most Oscar-nominated living person. He needs six more to overtake Walt Disney's record of 59 nominations. Williams has won five Oscars. His last was in 1994 for the score of Schindler's List, which also won the award for Best Picture. A record three films directed by women were nominated for Best Picture. Barbie from Greta Gerwig, Anatomy of a Fall from Justine Trier, and Past Lives from Celine Song. But only one of them, Trier, received a Best Director nomination. Gerwig's snub, along with Barbie star Margot Robbie's in the Best Actress category, were widely protested after the nominations were announced Tuesday but each is still in the larger group of nominees. 
Robbie is a producer who will get an Oscar if Barbie wins Best Picture. And Gerwig is nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay. Director Steven Spielberg was a 2024 Oscar presence, even on a year off. Spielberg did not direct a movie last year that met time limits for Academy Award consideration. However, he is nominated as a producer of the movie Maestro. If it wins Best Picture, Spielberg will take home his fourth Oscar. Martin Scorsese, meanwhile, broke Spielberg's record on director nominations. Scorsese is nominated this year for the movie The Killers of the Flower Moon. I'm Katie Weaver. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question from Bill in China about the word as. Dear VOA, thank you for your high-quality American English teaching. The following sentence is from one of your recent news, and I can't understand a bit of it. Would you like to help me? And the comedy Poor Things upset summer hit Barbie as Hollywood threw its biggest party since labor disputes shut down much of show business last year. To be precise, I can't understand the part after As Hollywood. I think As Hollywood might be a reason to describe the part before. Thanks a lot. Yours sincerely, Bill Yang from Beijing, China. Thank you for writing, Bill. This is a very good question. The word as has many meanings and uses in English. In your example, as is a subordinator. Subordinators are used to join two clauses and add information. In this sentence, as shows that the events were happening at the same time. The movie Poor Things upset the movie Barbie at the same time that Hollywood threw its biggest party. Both things happened at the Golden Globes earlier this month. In addition to meaning at the same time, as can be used to establish a reason. I don't need to write it down as I trust myself. I trust myself is the reason I don't need to write it down. As can also be used to point to the future. For example, as you're coming to the station, you'll see a pub in front of you. In this sentence, as points to a future time. As is often used as a subordinator in many longer phrases. These phrases include as long as, as soon as, as far as. There are many other ways to use as in a sentence. It can be a preposition, 
part of a prepositional verb and used with adjectives or adverbs for comparison. But we can talk about those meanings another time. We hope this explanation helps you understand the meaning of as in your example, Bill. Do you have a question about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Gina Bennett. You just heard this week's Ask a Teacher. Today, teacher Gina joins us. Welcome, Gina. Hi, Katie. In this week's program, we learned as can be a subordinator. Yes, subordinator as can show at the same time, refer to a point in the future, or give a reason. At the end of today's program, you mentioned that as can be used in other ways. Let's talk more about them now. Great idea. As is a subordinator when followed by a clause or a group of words with a verb. But when as is followed by a noun phrase, it's a preposition. So in the sentence, I don't need to write it down as I trust myself, as is a subordinator. But in the sentence, I was very serious as a student, as is a preposition. Exactly. And as is used in prepositional verbs like serve as or act as. For example, the teacher serves as an example. Is a prepositional verb like a phrasal verb? A prepositional verb is similar to a phrasal verb because it is a verb plus a particle, but it's different because a prepositional verb is always followed by a noun phrase. Okay, so preposition is followed by noun phrase. And then as can also be used with adjectives and adverbs, right? Yes, as is often used with adjectives to show similarity. Like, Washington is as hot as Tokyo in the summer. And as is used with adverbs to show extent or how much. Like, finish the project as quickly as possible. Great. I'm glad we got to talk about those additional meanings in the podcast today, Gina. Me too. Thanks for having me, Katie. Fall of the House of Usher, Part 1 It was a dark and soundless day, near the end of the year, and clouds were hanging low in the heavens. All day I'd been riding on horseback through country with little life or beauty, and in the early evening I came within view of the House of Usher. I do not know how it was, but with my first sight of the building, a sense of heavy sadness filled my spirit. I looked at the scene before me, at the house itself, at the ground around it, at the cold stone walls of the building, at its empty eye-like windows, and at a few dead trees. I looked at this scene, I say, with a complete sadness of soul, which was no healthy, earthly feeling. 
There was a coldness, a sickening of heart in which I could discover nothing to lighten the weight I felt. What was it, I asked myself, what was it that was so fearful, so frightening in my view of the House of Usher? This was a question to which I could find no answer. I stopped my horse beside the building, on the edge of a dark and quiet lake. There I could see reflected in the water a clear picture of the dead trees and of the house and its empty eye-like windows. I was now going to spend several weeks in this house of sadness, this house of gloom. Its owner was named Roderick Usher. We had been friends when we were boys, but many years had passed since our last meeting. A letter from him had reached me, a wild letter which demanded that I reply by coming to see him. He wrote of an illness of body, of a sickness of the mind, and of a desire to see me, his best, and indeed his only friend. It was the manner in which all this was said, it was the heart in it which did not allow me to say no. Although as boys we'd been together, I really knew little about my friend. I knew, however, that his family, a very old one, had long been famous for its understanding of all the arts, and for many quiet acts of kindness to the poor. I had learned, too, that the family had never been a large one, with many branches. The name had passed always from father to son, and when people spoke of the House of Usher, they included both the family and the family home. I again looked up from the picture of the house reflected in the lake to the house itself. A strange idea grew in my mind, an idea so strange that I tell it only to show the force of the feelings which had laid their weight on me. I really believe that around the whole house, and the ground around it, the air itself was different. It was not the air of heaven. It rose from the dead, decaying trees, from the gray walls and the quiet lake. It was a sickly, unhealthy air that I could see, slow-moving, heavy and gray. Shaking off from my spirit what must have been a dream, I looked more carefully at the building itself. The most noticeable thing about it seemed to be its great age. None of the walls had fallen, yet the stones appeared to be in a condition of advanced decay. Perhaps the careful eye would have discovered the beginning of a break in the front of the building, a crack making its way from the top down the wall until it became lost in the dark waters of the lake. I rode over a short bridge to the house. A man who worked in the house, a servant, took my horse and I entered. Another servant of quiet step led me without a word through many dark turnings to the room of his master. Much that I met on the way added... I do not know how, to the strangeness of which I have already spoken. While the objects around me, the dark wall coverings, the blackness of the floors, and the things brought home from long-forgotten wars, while these things were like the things I had known since I was a baby, while I admitted that all this was only what I had expected— I was still surprised at the strange ideas which grew in my mind from these simple things. The room I came into was very large and high. The windows were high and pointed at the top so far above the black floor that they were quite out of reach. Only a little light, red in color, made its way through the glass and served to lighten the nearer and larger objects. My eyes, however, tried and 
failed to see into the far high corners of the room. Dark coverings hung upon the walls. The many chairs and tables had been used for a long, long time. Books lay around the room, but could give it no sense of life. I felt sadness hanging over everything. No escape from this deep, cold gloom seemed possible. As I entered the room, Usher stood up from where he had been lying and met me with a warmth which, at first, I could not believe was real. A look, however, at his face told me that every word he spoke was true. We sat down, and for some moments, while he said nothing, I looked at him with a feeling of sad surprise. Surely no man had ever before changed as Roderick Usher had. Could this be the friend of my early years? It is true that his face had always been unusual. He had gray, white skin, eyes large and full of light, lips not bright in color, but of a beautiful shape, a well-shaped nose, hair of great softness, a face that was not easy to forget. And now the increase in this strangeness of his face had caused so great a change that I almost did not know him. The horrible white of his skin and the strange light in his eyes surprised me and even made me afraid. His hair had been allowed to grow, and in its softness it did not fall around his face, but seemed to lie upon the air. I could not even with an effort see in my friend the appearance of a simple human being. In his manner I saw at once changes came and went, and I soon found that this resulted from his attempt to quiet a very great nervousness. I had, indeed, been prepared for something like this, partly by his letter and partly by remembering him as a boy. His actions were first too quick and then too quiet. Sometimes his voice, slow and trembling with fear, quickly changed to a strong, heavy, carefully spaced, too perfectly controlled manner. It was in this manner that he spoke of the purpose of my visit, of his desire to see me, and of the deep delight and strength he expected me to give him. He told me what he believed to be the nature of his illness. It was, he said, a family sickness, and one from which he could not hope to grow better. But it was, he added at once, only a nervous illness which would, without doubt, soon pass away. It showed itself in a number of strange feelings. Some of these, as he told me of them, interested me, but were beyond my understanding. Perhaps the way in which he told me of them added to their strangeness. He suffered much from a sickly increase in the feeling of all his senses. He could eat only the most tasteless food. All flowers smelled too strongly for his nose. His eyes were hurt by even a little light, and there were few sounds which did not fill him with horror. A certain kind of sick fear was completely his master. I shall die, he said. I shall die. I must die of this fool sickness. In this way, this way and no other way, I shall be lost. I fear what will happen in the future, not for what happens, but for the result of what happens. I have indeed no fear of pain but only fear of its result, of terror. I feel that my time will soon arrive when I must lose my life and my mind and my soul together in some last battle with that horrible enemy, fear. 
That's all the time we have for today's show, but join us again tomorrow for another VOA Learning English program. Thanks for listening. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan 